You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the mysterious case of Theodosia Burr, a famous father, a murder trial, and a public outcry that all occurred even before her disappearance and afterwards there would be so many confessions and theories and the more you look into this case the more mysterious it becomes however many believe it was much more simple and everyone else just wanted it to be more fiction than reality by the way, I post so much content like this. Please make sure to subscribe down below. I only do these cases with the purest intentions. I never mean any harm to any of the victims, any of their family members, or anyone that I talk about. I truly just want to shed light to their stories and give them a platform where they can continue to be remembered so i would really appreciate your support and you can do that by thumbsing up this video or leaving a nice comment down below that would make me extremely happy now let's get back to the story it was 1783 in albany new york and that june 21st theodosia bartow burr would be born now she had two parents who were pretty known people to the world and they were theodosia the elder theodosia and Aaron Burr. And these two had kind of met under forbidden circumstances filled with scandal and lust and secrets. They had actually kept their kind of secret relationship friendship hidden for quite a while because at the time when they met, Theodosia was actually already married with five children. She was 10 years older than Aaron, but they immediately fell in love. They began writing letters back and forth. They really loved to get into each other's minds about, you know, philosophy and debate and just talking about deep things that often you don't find someone you can connect with in that way for. Both were very well educated and cultured people. I mean, they enjoyed hearing each other's opinions on these different things, especially because they had come from a little bit of a different background. They were also 10 years apart, so they could learn from each other. And there was only one problem in all of this because they had such a wonderful connection, but Theodosia still had a husband. Although, he would soon pass away, and I'm not exactly sure how, which some speculate is a little strange, but six months after that, Theodosia and Aaron would get married, and they would go on to have four children. However, three of those would pass, and Theodosia, the second Theodosia, would be the only surviving child. Now, because Theodosia was Aaron's only child, he really became a, not a strict parent, but one that wanted the world for their child and was going to give it to her regardless of the circumstances of the world. Aaron demanded that Theodosia get a good education and the same treatment as the other boys her age did because he really seemed to want to have equal rights for everybody and he didn't understand why men were treated differently than women. He wanted his daughter to experience life as he did. He also wanted her to kind of follow in his footsteps and he knew that the only way she would be able to do that is if it started young and he basically bred her to become his second. Now she was actually taught by tutors at their home because she wasn't allowed in schools and the bond between the father and daughter was actually really amazing and even when Aaron was away for work they they would often write to each other and make sure that there was still that connection and even though she was so young she would still remember her father because of course getting anywhere took much longer he couldn't just you know hop on a plane and come back it would be a much longer time period where he would have to be away and so they would often write to each other just as he had done with Theodosia's mother Theodosia when they first got together and at one point the mother actually wrote to Aaron about how much little Theodosia missed him as saying your dear little Theodosia cannot hear you spoken of without an apparent melancholy and so much that her nurse is obligated to exert her invention to divert her and myself avoid to mention you in her presence. She was one whole day indifferent to everything but your name. Her attachment is not of common nature. 
But Aaron had so much pride in his daughter and what she could do, who she would become, and he said, I hope yet by her to convince the world, but neither sex seems to believe that women have a soul. And the fact that Aaron so deeply wanted to make a difference for his wife and his daughter really is an incredible thing to hear all these years later to see how much has come from people like him wanting a change and even as a young girl little theodosia was known as little miss pris because she had quite the attitude but she was extremely smart she was witty and she was passionate with lots of drive she knew how to work hard she also just had that personality to keep up with adults i mean Anything the adults were doing, any conversation they were having, she was right there on top of it. It was once said that Theodosia had enough spark to ignite a warship. And Aaron was actually in the Senate at the time, but he was really wanting Theodosia to follow in his footsteps with that career path. And it really seemed to be going that way. Theodosia was learning at such a quick level. She had learned two languages by the time she was 15. I mean, she was extremely smart and well-educated. And this would all kind of change a little bit when she would turn 11 because unfortunately, her mother would pass away of stomach cancer. This meant that Theodosia would need to take over some of the motherly roles of the household and take over the residence care and this meant that she had a lot on her plate because not only was she supposed to continue her study, she was now taking care of the house and she was also dealing with grieving the loss of her mother and her father wasn't necessarily there all the time because he went to work. By 1800, things did start to look up for the family. You see, Theodosia would actually meet who she believed to be the love of her life. At the same time, her father, Aaron, would begin to flourish in his career. He would attend or be a part of a trial of Levi Weeks, who was a man that was charged with murder. And he and Alexander Hamilton would actually be the lawyers on this case. And I've done this case on my channel actually in full detail if you'd like to watch it. It's called the Manhattan Murder Well Case. I will have it linked down below. But basically, Levi was on trial for murder for Elma Sands, who was his girlfriend at the time, who was last seen leaving with him and Aaron and Alexander would be such wonderful lawyers that the jury would deliberate for five minutes before finding him not guilty. And the public was absolutely horrified by this verdict and they really believed that Levi was guilty and should have been imprisoned for it. The public hated Levi so much that even though he was found not guilty, he had to flee the country to get away from how much hate he was getting. But Aaron and Alexander, on the other hand, were just getting more popular by the minute. And of course, many different people were wanting to take them on as lawyers for their different cases because they won this case that didn't seem like it should have been won. While this was all happening for Aaron, Theodosia was actually falling in love with a man named Joseph Alton who was a wealthy the planter from South Carolina and Theodosia was courting him while also helping her father in his career because he was about to run for something that was so much bigger than anything he'd ever done before and he really needed her help. But Theodosia and Joseph would actually get married on February 2nd of 1801 when Theodosia was 18 and after this she would move to South Carolina with him to work on his plantation called the Oaks. A month later, Aaron would become the Vice President of the United States after he ran against Thomas Jefferson in the election and Thomas Jefferson of course became the third president of the United States and that's kind of how elections work during this time. There would be two people running and whoever won the runner-up would become the vice president. So at this time that would mean that Aaron Burr who was the runner-up would become vice president. Secretary of Treasury happened to be Alexander Hamilton, who Aaron actually knew from the Levi Weeks trial where he was a lawyer with him. And so this should have been kind of happy news. They knew each other, except it was anything but because these two could not get along. 
But happy news did come for Aaron because Theodosia would tell him that he was about to be a grandfather and when the baby came he was so incredibly excited. She named her son Aaron Burr Alston and his grandfather actually called him Gampy a lot. He was a healthy baby boy that came out just in time. However, his mother would not be so lucky. Theodosia was actually suffering from a prolapsed uterus, which meant not only was she in pain all the time, she also could not have any more kids, which is something that she appeared to want, but this was just not possible with how much pain she was in and just how she was left after the birth. She began to travel with Gamby a lot from South Carolina to New York where her father was just because, you know, a fatherly figure, just like a motherly figure, can bring a level of comfort and peace that sometimes a spouse or friends can't bring and so she would often go just to be by him in her time of pain but she would, of course, have to go back to South Carolina to be with her husband to help on the plantation and all of that but she did her best to continue to see her father, even with him being so busy. Now, at one point, Theodosia did go back to South Carolina for a while, and at this time, the disagreements between Aaron and Alexander would begin to turn into a full-blown feud, and Alexander started telling everybody he could that Aaron was not fit to be vice president, and that he even believed that Aaron and Theodosia, his daughter, were having some sort of a relationship, a deeper one than just a father and daughter bond. By 1804, Aaron had had enough of all of this, and that July 10th, he would actually sit down at his desk and write a letter to his daughter. It would say, I am indebted to you, my dearest Theodosia, for a great portion of the happiness which I have enjoyed in this life. You have completely satisfied all that of my heart and affections had even hoped for or even wished. It would be a goodbye letter because the next day he would challenge Alexander Hamilton to a duel and this would happen in the Weehawken, New Jersey field area where a lot of these duels would occur. They did anything but avoid death. Aaron would shoot Alexander in the stomach killing him and at this point he would become a murderer and he actually had to flee because he was being charged with murder in New Jersey and New York and because he was vice president he had a sort of immunity and so he just went on to live with Theodosia in South Carolina with her family while still working on his vice president duties but he was not tried and nor would he ever be tried for this murder. Theodosia actually loved having her father there at the home of course she didn't have to travel to see him and her son would get to see his grandfather all the time and she loved him being there but he wouldn't be there for long because he would actually tell her that he was about to make her an empress. Now, Aaron was going to head west to establish a new country made of North American territory as well as Mexico and this territory had not been broken up into states yet however it was in the process of doing so but Aaron decided he was be going to become the new emperor of this land but Aaron was still vice president and when Thomas Jefferson heard about this in 1807 he would be arrested on in February for treason in that August he would be put on trial but he would also be acquitted because they couldn't prove much to say it was actually treason and he was actually going to do this he would immediately flee to Europe because his public persona was absolutely tarnished after this, not only for the treason but also for the murder of Alexander Hamilton, which had gotten no justice. And the thing he felt the most regret for wasn't necessarily how people viewed him or what he had done, but what he did to his daughter because her public image was also tainted as well. Theodosia did not blame him though. She actually blamed the government officials that had brought him in, who had done this to her father, who made him flee the country. And she even wrote to the first lady of the United States begging her to let her father come home. She was really side by side with her father and did not believe he did any wrong. And truly just wanted him 
back in the United States with her. In 1812, that wish of hers would come true. However, he would move to New York where she was still in South Carolina and her husband was actually now the governor. They were making good money. They had a good, he had a good steady career. She was still working on the plantation, but her health was deteriorating and in a letter sent to a doctor about her, it said, the most violent affections have tormented her during the whole of the last 18 months. Hysteric fits, various colors and flashes of light before her. Yes, figures passing around her bed, strange noises, low spirits, and worse. To make matters worse, at this time, her son would actually pass of the malaria fever in which she had gotten a doctor and tried to do everything she could to save him, but there was nothing to be done. And in a letter she wrote about her father, she said, What indeed would I not risk once more to see him, to hang upon him, to place my child upon his knee, and again spend my days in the happy occupation of endeavoring to anticipate his wishes? There is no more joy for me. The world is blank. I have lost my boy. Theodosia alone now that her son had passed away and her husband was busy with work, she decided she was going to go see her father. And when she told Aaron of her plans, he immediately sent a friend of his named Dr. Timothy Green to help her out, to secure the boat, to protect her while on board and to get her back to him safely. That was his main job. And even though he knew quite well that Theodosia could handle herself self it was still a very dangerous journey because the war of 1812 was really happening in the Atlantic at this time and no one was really that safe while sailing so this was kind of a treacherous journey the trip from South Carolina to New York would take about five to six days at this time they would take the Patriot out of the port of Georgetown on December 31st and it would be Theodosia Dr. Green as well as a maid and the crew. Theodosia's husband actually got them a diplomatic letter that would let them through the British blockade and they actually would be stopped in that very area two days later after they left the port and they would be let through. However, this would be the last time anyone would see them, the entire ship. When Aaron went to pick her up at the time she was supposed to arrive, he didn't know that he would be waiting the rest of his life for her. Theodosia's husband Joseph wrote to Aaron saying, in three weeks I have not yet had one line from her. My mind is tortured. After 30 days my wife is either captured or lost. My boy and my wife, gone both. This, then in the end of all the hopes we had formed. You may well observe that you feel severed from the human race. She was the last thing that bound us to the species. Somewhere along the Atlantic Sea, Theodosia and many others on board, everyone on board, had disappeared and searches were conducted but they came up with nothing and three years later, her husband Joseph still was not the same from losing his wife and his son and he would actually pass away in 1816 but Aaron had pretty much given hope, given up hope on finding his daughter alive. He said, she's dead. She perished in the miserable little pilot boat in which she left. Were she still alive? All the prisons in the world could not keep her from her father. Now the theories in this case, even from the beginning, were extremely wild. Many sightings and confessions fueled them and there was one that said the same year that Joseph died in 1816, there was said to be a veiled lady that got off a ship on Alexandria, Virginia. And it was a man and a woman who said that they were husband and wife who booked a hotel room and they refused to tell anyone their names that the woman was sick and actually called for a doctor. She died that October and was actually buried there at the St. Paul Episcopal Graveyard and, and it was written on her tombstone that she was a female stranger who was about 23 years old. This would be significantly younger than what Theodosia would have been at that time, but some believe this could have been Dr. Timothy Green and Theodosia Burr. And this grave still stands today 
and nobody knows who it was. Then on June 23rd, 1820, a confession was made by two men named Jean DeFargas and Robert Johnson. The two claimed to be working on the Patriot when Theodosia got on and said that two to three days into their journey, they actually took over the ship. They put everyone in the hold, they stole all the valuables, and then they sunk the ship, killing everyone inside. They confessed on their deathbeds, which was actually more of right before their executions because they had been executed for other unrelated crimes. But the only problem with this theory was that the two had said that the weather had been calm for three days. However, it was proven that that wasn't true. There was actually a large storm that had come during that time. The two also said that the Patriot left Charleston, but we know that it actually left from Georgetown. Then there was another confession by a man named Benjamin F. Burdick, who is also known as Old Frank. He was a hard, rough, old salt of a sailor, is how people described him. And on his deathbed, he had actually told a minister's wife that he had been responsible for Theodosia's death. He said he had been on a pirate ship that took over the Patriot during their journey. He said that no one wanted to kill Theodosia because she was so beautiful and so kind. So they actually took bets on who would do so and he was chosen to do so. So he had to force her to walk the plank. He described what happened and he said, there was one lady on board who was beautiful, appearing intelligent and cultivated, who gave her name as Miss Theodosia Alston. When her turn came to walk the fatal plank, she asked for a few moments' time, which was gruffly granted her. She then retired to her berth and changed her apparel, appearing on deck in a few moments, clad in pure white garments. And with a Bible in her hand, she announced that she was ready. She appeared as calm and composed as if she were at home, and not a tremor crept over her frame or a pallor overspread her features as she walked towards her fate. As she was taking her fatal step, she folded her hand over her bosom and raised her eyes to heaven. She fell and sank without a murmur or a sigh. The only problem with this statement was that Theodosia was said not to be religious at all and many thought it was strange that she would be holding a Bible. And many of these confessions were lacking the physical evidence to prove that they were true because they were just stories. But then a piece of this ship was thought to be found. In 1969, a Dr. William Poole and his daughter Anna were in Nags Head, North Carolina when they would go to a patient's home. And Anna immediately looked at this portrait on the wall and she just couldn't shake this feeling of something eerie. And she almost recognized this woman. She was very beautiful. And she kind of told her father about it. And they realized this, that this woman looked a lot like Theodosia Burr. The owner of the painting was a woman named Polly Mann, who said that her husband, who was now deceased, had actually found this painting. He was one who scavenged shipwrecks, and he said that he found it around the year of 1813 in the cabin of a shipwreck schooner, which is what the Patriot was, and this was near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, which the Patriot would have had to pass by going from South Carolina to New York. Polly said her husband had told her of this whole cabin he had found of fine items. I mean, there was portraits, dresses, wax flowers, glass globes, and shells beautifully carved. And Dr. Poole said that he would treat Polly because he was there, he was a doctor, to treat her. He said he would treat her and all he would ask for in return for payment is this portrait of who he believed to be Theodosia Burr. He would take it and he would go around to the Burrs and the Alstons and try to find an exact answer as to if this was Theodosia based on what they knew of her and how she looked. Because of course, you know, pictures, photographs were not common during this time and although they had money, only a certain amount of them were done. 
so it'd be harder to identify her other than by her family. But when he was asking people, he couldn't get a real answer. Some of the family members said, yeah, that looks like her. Looks like her beautiful eyes. Others said, no, I mean, not really. It doesn't look like her at all. But the painting was named Nag's Head Portrait and it is now being kept at the Lewis Walpole Library at Yale to be preserved and, of course, kept in case further evidence is found as to who this is, but the portrait led many to believe that this wasn't a pirate attack at all because if these riches were still found in the cabin, that means that no one stole anything. So maybe the ship just wrecked on its own accord. I mean, storms were reported on the Outer Banks at this time and the Patriot could have been damaged like the other ships in the area were reported to be. So was it as simple as Theodosia being lost at sea? And if so, why did she have that painting on board of herself? Was this for her father? Why? Was this just something that was gifted to her? Well, according to the Gone Podcast, in 1974, a story was published saying that a man named John Baptist Gallistre was a crewman of a pirate ship called the Vengeance, and he had claimed that they had taken over the Patriot and took Theodosia as prisoner, but she had actually died on the journey. And I do feel like this could be a possibility too, because she was so sick that you know, if somebody were to take her prisoner, I don't think she would have lasted very long, especially in those horrible conditions where she wasn't being looked after by a doctor. But, but this case is filled with crazy stories of vengeance, love, sacrifice, murder, but could it be as simple as just being lost at sea? I mean, the whereabouts of Theodosia Burr and her companions on that boat have never been found and nobody knows what happened to them at all. It was a dangerous time to be out on the water and just because there seems to be unusual circumstances doesn't mean that there was. And you have to wonder if the infamous Aaron Burr's daughter Theodosia Burr was not on board, would this case even be known by now? Or would it have been lost in history? because we don't even know the names of the other passengers that were lost as well. Their family members lost a loved one and we don't even remember their names. I think sometimes that's the hardest part for me doing these cases that are more vintage is that it really is from who chose to keep those records back then. And a lot of the times it's people who were more famous, more wealthy or white people. I just want to make you guys aware that I understand that these cases are not necessarily kept because they're the most interesting or the most important. It's who people thought were the most important at the time, but I believe every human is important no matter their situation, no matter what they look like. So. I wanted to do Theodosia's case because it was quite interesting and because, of course, we love vintage cases, but just know that I know that this case probably wouldn't have even be t been told years later if she wasn't the daughter of Aaron Burr. So I hope going forward in history, we start telling the stories of people who aren't crazy famous or crazy rich or crazy beautiful. We tell the stories of people who are normal, of people who still deserve their stories to be told because no human deserves to be forgotten. I did think this was a very strange one and I'd love to hear your opinions on what happened to her below. I do think much more people wanted it to be fiction than just listening to the truth because I do think it's a good possibility that she was just lost at sea. And I think this portrait of her is the one thing that just freaks me out. I just feel like something about it, it is her, is how I feel. But would she bring it on board herself? I don't know. Could this have pointed to this being a pirate ship that wrecked? And maybe when they took her prisoner, they drew a painting of her because they thought she was beautiful and wanted her to be immortal? Just something to think about. 
But thank you so much for listening. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.